In a basement flat in Hackney, the telephone rings. It's two in the morning. Isla Green stands in the hallway, pajamaed, barely awake. She is entirely sober. A good thing, if a little fragile, a little surprising. No tide of shame waits for her, no bloom of pain. She feels clean in her skin, like a schoolgirl. She can taste toothpaste in her throat. On the third ring, she reaches for the receiver. It's Dom's voice. She will hear it if the answering machine picks up, and his voice will set her back. It's been three months since he left, and every day she means to wipe the message. She lifts it to her ear just in time. Hello? It takes her second to place him. Dad? I didn't wake you, did I? He doesn't know why she's gripping the receiver, why a th trill of fear has sounded in her head. It's good to hear her dad's voice, which is more Australian than her own these days. It's got the time difference wrong, that's all. At the end of the street, a police siren starts its upward loop and cuts out, its blue lights flashing silently. What time is it there? I don't know. She stretches her free arm above her head arching her back. In the eight weeks and three days since her last drink, she has been sleeping like the dead. Shall I call back later? It's fine. Is everything okay? I want to talk to you, he says. Your mother doesn't know I'm calling. She went into town. She sits down on the carpet. This is a thing that couldn't put her finger on and what she should have known was wrong from a start. Her dad hasn't called her in the decade she's lived in London. It's her mum who makes the phone calls, leaves messages on the answering machine. Her dad writes letters. He hates phones. What is it? I didn't want, he, want you to hear it from your mother. She hasn't taken it well. I wanted to tell you myself. She drops her head between her knees. She thinks, if he's going on to die, I'll need a drink. Cold, practical thoughts. She will finish this call and she will put her clothes on. There's all, an all-night takeaway at Clapton Pond where they sell six packs of beer under the counter. The police came to see me, he says. The police? They're looking for a woman I used to know. Isla lifts her head. She's sweating. She runs her hand through her damp hair. What woman? She was a neighbor of ours back when we first moved to Sydney. You wouldn't remember, he coughs. It looks like she's been missing a long time. Nobody's seen her in 30 years. The police car crawls outside, swinging its blue light across the wall. What's this got to do with you? The police think her disappearance is suspicious, he says. They think I was the last person to see her before she went missing. And were you? She tries to sound calm. Were you the last person to see her? I can't have been. She moved away with her husband. I told them that must be some mistake. He lights a cigarette, exhales. She thinks of Dom, smiling behind a flame. Is he? she dead? They think she might be. His voice is quiet. A bad news voice. There's no record of her at all. In all that time, her father died last month, left her most of his estate, but she w hasn't come forward. Her brother's been asking around, trying to trace her. He turned up a few things the police are looking into. He laughs convincingly. One of those things is me. Isla finds a line of stubble along her shin. She runs her thumbnail over it back and forth, back and forth, until it hurts. The cops are searching through the records. He says, they keep records of people who have died without being identified. What if it turns out she was killed? That would be the worst case scenario, love, he says. That would mean a murder inquiry. Jesus. Look, I don't want you to worry, but if you were the last person to see her. I wasn't, he shouts it. I told you, I wasn't. Isla rests her head back on her knees. In the part light, she sees unopened post on the doormat, soiled with the tread of her lace-up boots, her bike leaning against the wall, its basket stuffed with junk mail. Unhooked by the door, the smart coat with the belt that she was wearing to the office, all of it is familiar, unchanged. Are you there? I'm here, she says. Sorry to snap at you. Dad, she feels hot, but her skin is cold, her pajamas cling to her. What was her name? He hesitates. Mandy. Mandy. Isla smells a hot iron against cotton sheets. Eucalyptus. She looked after you a few days a week before you started school, back when your mum was working at the hoarder and sons. She had a washing line strung out across her yard, Isla says, remembering as she speaks. I used to hand her the pegs when she hung up the laundry. Did you? Isla can't recall Mandy's face, but she remembers being in her presence, being like someone she liked, an easiness about her company that made other people seem less than her.
She want her, your mother wants to cancel the party from her birthday, he continues. Hasn't been upset since the police called around. She can't put it out of her mind. A door slams in one of the up flats. Raised voices. Isla sits up. She understands now why he called. Does she believe you, Dad? I don't think so. No. She cradles the phone. New connectors are opening her brain these past few weeks, fueled by mineral water and sleep. Unbidden memories startled her on the bus on the escalator at Bethnal Green. As she sits in traffic on Essex Road, her life has an awful clarity now that the protective hungover fog is gone. She sits cross-legged on the carpet in the middle of her life in its crisp central crease. She's 35 years old, tall and lean, striking, people say. A body that has been neglected but is still strong, surprisingly resilient. A thick head of hair cropped short at the back, blonde strands on top that grow up and out like a dandelion. A woman whose life took a nosedive, who is getting herself together, who needs to be careful, whose father is silent at the other end of the line, asking her wordlessly to come home. I could come back for a couple of weeks, she says. It's the only thing to say. I could help with the party, get mum to see sense. Could you? I think so. I'm owed some leave. That would be wonderful, Isla. His voice has lifted. What about the apartment? Aren't you buying a place? The apartment. A two-bedroom on Sinclair Road with high ceilings and a Juliet balcony. It's beautiful, well-located, and well over budget. They close in three weeks. She rubs her forehead with the heel of her hand. I can deal with it over the phone, she says. Can they spare you at work? They'll have to. Are you sure this is a good time for you? No, she's not sure. She doesn't want to be in Sydney, where there are an empty hours to fill and people she hasn't seen in a decade. She wants to sleep and work and hide. I'm sure, she said. It's about time. Rain falls hard over London as the sun comes up. Isla lies on the surface of sleep, refusing the dreams that want her to be four years old again, walking through the rooms that are familiar but not home. She starts the day, dresses herself. Her dad's voice is loud and scared in her head, playing on a loop, acquiring a strain of panic. She makes coffee, tells herself she does not need anything stronger. She's overthinking this whole thing. He is not lying.